welcome everybody. Um, we're in another episode of Scan is Here to Help podcast. We're happy that you have joined us today. Today we have um, uh, an incredible guest, um, an expert in, in children, and uh, we want to talk to you about uh, screen time and how good or, or what are the, the pros and the cons of the children spending time interacting with screens, iPhones, uh, iPads, and so forth. But before I continue, let me introduce myself. My name is Luis Flores, and I'm the Executive Vice President of SCAN. And with me is... I'm Juanita Guerra, and I work for Border Project Launch with SCAN. Um, and I am an infant and early childhood mental health consultant. And this is a topic that we get a lot of questions from, from parents. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of, um, <clears throat> I think, misinformation or misunderstanding of what's appropriate and what's not. Um, but I think more importantly is how is this affecting our children exactly. and will continue to affect them in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, this, this is an exciting topic. And SJ, as we uh, call her uh, in the agency, SJ is not only has the knowledge and the experience, but she's also is a mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's, you have a four-year-old, four mm -hmm. and then you're expecting another, another child. One on the way. So yeah. you, you can put into practice everything that you learn into the children. Yes. My, so, if, if my daughter so. were here, you know, she's kind of like the guinea pig of everything. <laughs> I try everything on her. And, you know, um, and like anything else, every child is different. So it can be a cookie cutter approach yeah. with these things. But there's definitely some recommendations that yes. can be helpful to any parent. Yeah, and I, I just want to remind the public that each child is unique. And they have different characteristics, different needs, different temperaments. And how do you understand the needs of your, chi your child or your children um, is really important because how you react to, to them uh, in understanding if you have a child, for example, that is a lot more active mm -hmm. or a child that is just isolates themselves, a child that, is, that has difficulty um, managing emotions. Mm -hmm. These are sometimes a part of what they're born with, mm -hmm. as we call temperaments. So how important it is, I guess, to understand your child, not mm -hmm. have expectations. Because you may have a child that does, you know, we call them good, you know, they're all good children, mm -hmm. but we tend to like those that are calmer, calmer right? Mm -hmm. that they, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And then we tend to make comparisons sometimes, and that can be detrimental for the kids. So I don't know if you want to Absolutely yeah, especially correct. between siblings, you know, um, sometimes, you know, you have your first child and it was a pretty smooth ride. They're very um, <clears throat> calm. They're very uh, quick to self-entertain themselves, things like that. Then you get your second or your third and, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> they come along with other challenges that you were not prepared for or had any experience with. And so we have to be very careful not to compare the children, you know. How come you can't be more like your brother, you know, at your age, your sister, this? Exactly. Every child is different. Every child develops differently. Every child um, learns through different styles of learning. So it's so important to really keep that in mind and not put that on the children because it can be very detrimental, especially yes. to their self-esteem, their self-image, and then obviously the connection to the adult, right, mm -hmm. to the caregiver. And so these are things to really keep in mind. Um, even in our most frustrating, you know, despairing times, I know I, I, I've been there, you know, before anything, we're human. And so being a parent is the toughest job in the world. It is. Mm -hmm. It is a highly complex job yeah. and that has a, a lot of demands. And I think it is important that we remind people about that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, I don't know who, some uh, follower of Freud talked about the good enough mother, so I'm thinking the good enough parent. But we don't need perfection in parents, mm -hmm. but we need to have certain qualities in them that, especially the ability to reconnect, because sometimes you're gonna lose it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. With the demands of, and then, so it's okay, you can repair that, with those, mm -hmm. you know, when, when there's some disconnect between the children and the parent. Yeah, and that's so easy nowadays, you know? We don't live in simpler times. <laughs> These are not the times of our grandparents where, you know, at least one parent was at home all the time. Sure. You know, nowadays families, you know, to sustain themselves, both parents work sometimes multiple jobs, 
or uh, one parent is working from home and you know now with technology and then you know so they're and we're split so many ways and then you know with social media um there's all these expectations on parents yes. um especially on moms in terms of you know doing all these things for your kids and you know the everyday mom is probably saying out of what time yeah. <laughs> you know? do we have time for all of this um, so I think that the main thing is just to have realistic expectations, realistic goals, and just be kind to yourself as a parent. Yeah. Because if we are trying to do so much, and like you said, you use the word perfection, be the perfect parent, um, that could be so detrimental to our own physical and mental health. But then what does that do in terms of the relationship with yes. the children? Yes, and I wonder sometimes our own ideas of perfection can get in the way of connecting with the kids, mm -hmm. because you be you can be criticizing yourself and and having all these negative thoughts, but the child is right there. You can always start from scratch and then reconnect with that. And and I, I know that kids love that when parents are letting them know that that they love them and that's okay. That you know yes. doesn't matter what happens. Oh yes, you know. Um, <clears throat> In our program, we always talk about the power of play, how powerful that is, how strong that is. And it's not just about children playing outside. No, the power of play in terms of the parent being involved in the play with the child and really working on these very fundamental human connections, yes. uh, communication, uh, socializing, the basics of playing with others, sharing, taking turns. Yeah. That comes from modeling yeah, for them at home. Exactly. And um, if we're not spending enough time with our kids doing such activities, yes. um, then we can't just expect them to just know, exactly. right? The children don't just know. Um, it's not instinctual to share. It's not instinctual no. to take turns. Right. Children really struggle That's with that. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's not a, a human thing that we just naturally have. This has to be modeled and guided yes. and, and you know, for it to be something that's normal. Because if not, then they go to, you know, to preschool for the first time and you know, parents start to get complaints from, from teachers or concerns from teachers. And it's very overwhelming yes. to show up to school and yet again, teacher has a concern. And you as a parent are like, I don't know what else to do. Um, but it could have been something that we could have been proactive about. Yes. So, and, and today's topic is something that I always talk about in terms of being proactive with your kids versus trying to be retroactive. Yes. And then it's not that it can't be uh, 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 improved, but it's definitely very challenging. Yes, and, and I'm gonna get, we're going to get to the screens uh, right now, mm -hmm. but I think it is important for me to highlight the importance of spending time with a child, communicating to them with them through play, because the language, play is the language of the children, yes. and how that can be um, a medium to teach many skills. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I just want to give you a quick story. I had I was a I used to do a lot of play therapy for a long time. I was a registered play therapy supervisor. And uh, I had a, a big playroom where I would do sessions with kids. And the kids would love it because I know, you know how to, we, the skills that we use. Um, and uh, mine was child-centered play therapy. And the parents got really excited. So when they would leave the session, they would tell their parents, look, I have this story. And it was so nice. And they would tell them all the stories about what happened in our sessions. And then the parents would tell me, well, you know what, I, I got, them the toys, but they don't play with them. And I was telling them, well, it's not the toy so much as what happens, you know, when you interact with that toy, you use that toy to engage a child. And um, and then I'm, I want to link it right now a little bit to the screens in the sense that nothing can replace that. Yeah. It doesn't matter how stimulating it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't mind then um, just talking about how powerful uh, electronics are, I mean, screens are, in the sense that um, when I was born a long time ago, <laughs> we didn't have any, we didn't have calculators, we had, you know, we didn't have anything, any, any PCs didn't exist, no internet, of course. Mm -hmm. 
uh, no computers. So we had to interact with each other. We had to deal with boredom and stuff like that. Yeah. And now it's so convenient that I, if I have a question about anything, I, I have it in the palm of my hand. And then I have that, I have my email, I have texts that I can communicate with, I'm in chats, mm -hmm. uh, I have games that I play, you know, um, I can get a, a video on YouTube, I can find out pretty much everything in the palm of my hand. Yep. And that's how advanced, uh, you know, our society has been. And there's incredible use that we can give to that. Mm -hmm. However, we have seen a lot of people uh, develop an addiction to screens, mm -hmm. adults, um, so then we need to be really careful about uh, the screen time, right, with children. Mm -hmm. So then let's, let's, let's delve into that a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, any, anything, any thoughts about um, what kind of recommendations we can give to parents about screen time or... Um, I mean, well, there's definitely a lot of research already out there mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the, the American Pediatric Association has some recommendations or the CDC has some recommendations. And overall, the recommendations, and we'll go through the recommendations um, just as a guide, but again, not a cookie cutter approach yes. because every child is different, every family is different. Um, but really what we're, what we're seeing across the board in terms of research is that children under the age of 18 months shouldn't be getting any screen time at all, mm -hmm. at all, yet. So this is zero to a year and a half. Yet, how many one-year-olds do you see at the doctor's office, a restaurant, whatever, and they're holding already either a tablet or their parent's phone or something, right? Um, and the reason for this is because this is such a tender age, right? And not just that, but the first five years of a child's life, right? We call them the wonder years. They're such a tender age. And so if this is how children are learning to interact, per se, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm or get information, yeah. then that's what they learn to do as mm -hmm. the years go on. And so if we suddenly cut that off and say, well, now you have to go to school and make friends yeah. and be social, they're not going to like it. Yeah. It's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to yeah. feel foreign, right? It's going to yeah. be very foreign. So zero to 18 months, the recommendation across the board is no screen time. Of course, there could be exceptions to that, um, you know, in recent years because of COVID, we've had to do a lot of FaceTime with relatives to keep yeah. connecting. Th that's that's kind of like the exception there. Yeah, this, you, you also want them to know yeah. their family and know those faces and be familiar with those and, faces. And grandparents may want to see their right, grandchildren. Right, and interact and talk. Um, so, of course, through FaceTime or things like Zoom or other platforms, it allows us the opportunity to interact with those that we might not be able to see on right. a regular basis. So that's kind of like the exception to that. But, but there's a utility yeah. about it. Exactly. There's yeah. a purpose for it. Yeah. The purpose is communication mm -hmm. and connection. Mm -hmm. um, then children 18 to 24 months, the recommendation is maybe a few minutes, 15 minutes tops a day. Yeah. Not in a sitting, <laughs> a day. And then children um, two to five, the recommendation is not more than an hour a day. And so oftentimes when I have these conversations with parents in, in our practice, they are very shocked by those statistics or that data mm -hmm. because they say, I know they're thinking to themselves, I know my four-year-old spends more than an hour on the tablet yes. every day. Um, not to mention that screens are being used with a utility purpose mm -hmm. in other areas of children's lives. You know, your, your typical four or five-year-old, they're in pre-kinder, kinder. kinder. Mm -hmm. Screens are already being used in the classroom exactly. for educational purposes. So you can, as a parent, you know, if you have a, a, a pre-K child or a kinder child in school, you can pretty much assume that when they come home to you at the end of the day, mm -hmm. they've already had quite a bit of screen time at yes. school. Um, whether that was them having their own handheld device or in uh, a lot of technology already being used in the classroom by, by, the, by the educators. Mm -hmm. So um, so then that's when we have to you know, evaluate this. You know, when they get home, what's the routine when you get home? And, um, and I know, I, I, again, as a parent, I understand and I've talked to many parents about, you know, why do they feel the need to give them the screens? Yeah. And of course, many times it's because parents are overwhelmed. Exactly. Um, you know, they're trying to get 
dinner on the table mm. and they just want the children and to be safe and in one place and yeah. not all over the place or fighting with each other. You know, there's families where each child has their own device. I see. I see. Um, yeah. 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 And so I understand why parents go to these measures. But I think one very important thing to keep in mind as parents is this is a temporary solution to what I'm dealing with right now. Yes. What's going to be the long term consequences exactly. of this? And we're seeing it. Yeah. We're seeing it everywhere. Educators are seeing it, especially in this post COVID era. I mm. think not only did children go on screen for school yeah. in many cases, it's true, right? So they were already connected to a computer six, seven, eight hours a day. Yeah. And then, you know, I don't know if, you know, in, in certain homes, maybe they were getting additional screen time after that just for the sh entertainment or silly videos or whatever. And so it's like, how many hours a day did that child spend in front of a screen versus connecting mm. with another human? Yeah, you wonder about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just have a lot of mm -hmm. things in my mind that we talk about the challenges of parent, of parenthood. It is tough to be a parent, and uh, especially if you have two or three kids at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I imagine a mom or a dad going to the doctor's office, and instead of chasing around the kid that you know is getting on the furniture or throwing magazines on the floor, mm -hmm. which some of them you know suspect at that age, they're curious, mm -hmm. depending on their age, um, and it is tough to be doing that. So. It, it, it is a sense because it is a tough job mm -hmm. that sometimes becomes convenient mm -hmm. to sit them down and just give them a, a cell, their cell phone uh, or any of their, you know, those little pads now so they can sit down mm -hmm. and they don't have to deal with that. So sometimes it, it is sort of uh, because it is a challenging job mm -hmm. and it is exhausting sometimes be chasing you, you know, if you have a five-year-old and a two-year-old and, you know, and, and then if you, they become a, a little bit, they're tired or whatever, they become a little bit challenging, then you have people there. And so it's easier just to give a screen, okay, you know, and then sit down. Yes. And so since there are bound to be those situations and now we have this technology, you yeah. know, our parents didn't have that because we went to the doctor's office. You just had to yeah. sit there. And, <laughs> you know, your mom gave you a certain look and, you know. Um, but um, but I understand those situations. So precisely because those situations tend to come about, yeah. doctor's appointments, um, um, taking them somewhere where you need them to stay calm, whether it's you know maybe on a flight or something, because those moments are bound to come around, that's why when we're at home, the screen time needs to be very limited, yeah. right? Because these have to be almost like exceptions Right. Well, we're at the doctor's office and I know that my kiddos, there's no way they're just going to stay seated waiting 30 minutes, an hour sometimes for the doctor. Yeah. I have to be realistic. Mm -hmm. And I think for parents, it's also and I need to keep my sanity at the same time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and so so I understand those moments. Definitely. Um, as a parent or a four year old, I can tell you right now, those are the times that we yeah. employ those things. Right. But the rest of the time. When we're at home, yeah. where we spend most of our time, or where the child spends most of their time, what's going on there, right? And that's where we come in with this whole concept of the power of play. Yeah. Um, it's so important to spend that special time with your child. Um, and sometimes, you know, parents will tell me, oh, I, I play with my kid every day. And I say, okay, describe that to me. And it goes kind of like mm -hmm. this. Yeah, well, I, I let them bring out their toys and we set them up and then I'm, I'm sitting there watching them. <laughs> That's supervising play. Yeah. That's not playing with your child. Playing with your child. playing with your child means you get down on the floor if you're playing something on the floor. You get on the table with them if it's a board game. You go outside and throw the ball. You are engaged. You are part of the activity. Yeah. And... It's fun and it's, you know, exciting for the kids. And again, we as the adults in the room are modeling those human interactions that are so essential, yeah. right? Again, uh, socialization, um, being kind to others, mm -hmm. 
taking turns, sharing. Mm -hmm. We model all that so that when they do get to school, this is not something foreign to them. This is something they're like, oh, yeah, sharing. Yeah, okay. I yeah. have to wait my turn. Okay. Um, it's just something very, very. Well, and, and, and I think that mm -hmm. what I find the most valuable about that mm -hmm. is that when you interact with a child in a certain way, right? Because it's not only interacting, but interacting where you focus on the needs of the child, where you show understanding, where you enjoy your child, you know, the uniqueness of your child. And then, so you, you're sending indirectly the message, you're important to me. Yes, and because the child says, I'm important to my dad yeah. or my mom, and or my mom, then I, I am a good kid, or I, I develop positive things about me, simply because my parent gives me that attention. And exactly. I think that's so powerful. Very powerful. So in, in our program, we have a, a form of, of, of parent-child interaction therapy, and um, those are the skills that we guide the parents on. It's yeah. not just about what's coming out of your mouth, but the energy that you put into it. If the child feels like they are seen, yeah. heard, praised, that you're having fun with them. So this is not something that you feel like you have to do. That you're having fun with them. That is such a powerful exactly. message to a child. And it, and it, and it uh, sends that, exactly that message. Yeah. The message of, I see you. I love you. I'm here, you have my 100% attention, and there's nothing more important in this moment yes. than this, than you and I, right here. And yeah. uh, it just triggered my, an image in my mind that there are many other things, you know, the problem solving, a bunch of other stuff that can happen as a, as a result of uh, interacting with your child. Mm -hmm. Because uh, sometimes um, showing understanding, tracking what they do, um, and even if they, they struggle, let's say, putting together um, Legos, mm -hmm. and you wait, and you say, wow, you're trying really hard, or you use a lot of reflection. Yeah, yeah you're trying to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. And once that they put it together and say, wow, you, you, you did it. You did it, you worked really hard at it, and you were able to get it. Yeah. And the satisfaction of the child increases self-competence about themselves. So it's, like, it's, it's different than when you want to fix it for them, right? Yes. And they do it this way. So. Yes, yes. I'm so <laughs> glad you brought that up because many times in our therapy sessions, that's one of the hardest things for parents to undo yeah. is wanting to solve everything for their child. You know, it's like, okay, stop, give it to me, I'll show you how. Um, correcting them yeah. and then taking over the play. Once we take over the play, the play's not fun anymore. Exactly. You know, this play is this special time of freedom for kids. It's like, for example, I, I was just at a Head Start earlier this morning, and of course, in, inside the classroom, it's structured, there's a schedule. Um, everybody has to sit in their own space, in their own seat, uh, you know, do all the activities. But when it was time for outdoor play, of course, you know, they follow instructions in terms of getting in a line and going out there. But once teacher says, okay, everybody good, go play. It's freedom. It's freedom for the child. Mm -hmm. They're outdoors. Um, right now here in Laredo, the weather's really nice. What perfect time to be doing outdoor activities yeah. with your kids. Um, and then, they're, again, they're free. And there's very little rules to that, right, other than safety rules. Um, but that's why we're there. That's why we're present and we're playing with them. And so it's just such a different energy and dynamic with children when you just give them that opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying this is going to be all day, every day in your house. Obviously, there's going to be times where um, you have to, everybody sits down at the table for, for, for dinner and uh, you got to do uh, the chores that you're assigned, of course. But in those moments of play, so what we really, really emphasize is if we really learn to play with our kids, there should be little to no need for screens. Yeah, right, exactly. because we're we're replacing that, or we unfortunately we have replaced that with screens. Well, and there are the different things that I want to talk about because you're triggering a lot of ideas um, about that. Um, I lost it, but anyway, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that um, what about adults when they get addicted to that? Because I'll, I'll give you one one scenario. And I think it happens a great deal of times when you, you go to a restaurant, usually, and everybody has their, their iPhone or whatever, mm -hmm. a smartphone. 
uh, or tablet. And then there was this instance where there was a child and a little carrier on the floor, and the parents were uh, were on the phone. And uh, I, we don't know. I don't want to make assumptions. You know, mm -hmm. it's just something that happened. But it, it triggered in me that they realized the importance of looking at that child, of talking to that child, the importance of, of saying, you know, let me put this down, because I have my child here with me. And with that sense of pride, and because I think that child really needed what we call servant returns. I mean, he needs a right. uh, oh, baby, you know, and the baby gets all excited. Mm -hmm. We don't think that this is really, really important uh, in terms of the development of the child, how those connections that are ongoing are important. So, yes, I, I don't know. I don't know what you want to comment about that. But and I, and I, we probably were at the same restaurant because I've seen it <laughs> so many times. And then I think something there is also the connection between the caregivers, right? Yeah. If, if you're at a restaurant and you're both on your screen, there's no communication happening there either. Exactly. So there's no modeling of communication. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the children, you know, when, when they're joining us for a meal, they are part of that meal. They yeah. are part... They are to be part of the interaction, the communication, all of it. It's just like when we have a meal together at home. For most families, it's dinner time because during the day, children are at school, parents yeah. are working. So dinner time may be a very um, powerful tool to model these things, right? And including wait your turn, right? Yeah. Daddy's telling something to mommy. Okay, now your turn. You know, that kind of interaction. Yes. Um, but, um, but that takes me to another point. That was in a restaurant. But this is probably happening at home. Too, yes, right? this is yeah. probably happening at home. I mean, I've, I've been in homes where um, a meal is, is ready and everybody gets their plate and disperses. Mm -hmm. Maybe mom and dad sit at the table, but one kid is over there on the tablet mm -hmm. and another kid is in front of the television. Mm -hmm. And so meal times can be a very powerful way yeah. of also interacting with our children, not just through play. And of course, during meal times, we're also modeling other things, uh, good manners, how to use your utensils, yeah. Share, you know, sharing, sharing. Um, oh, yeah. you know, there's there's one row left, who wants it, should we split it in half? And we can say, you yeah. know what, there's only one row left, I'm gonna share with mom. Right. So we, we're modeling, mm -hmm. uh, would you like me to share with your buddy, yeah. you know? And so then we model instead of saying you have to share, you know, we're yeah. actually telling them how it is done. So when they share, we can say, Hey, you share with your sister, I'm so proud of you. Right. You, you know, you like there to share. There come those opportunities to yes. praise them, to highlight what they've done well. So they want um, to imitate them. And, 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 they, and what do we know in our research, right? Yeah. Whatever behaviors we praise and we highlight and we cheer them on for are the behaviors we're more likely to see repeated. You need an adult to pay attention to it mm -hmm. and recognize it though. Right, because yeah. if nobody does, then the child has no idea exactly. that this is what's expected or this is what is appreciated and that they're doing well. Again, that those little feeds and boosts mm -hmm. to their um, self-esteem and their confidence. Um, and so these are very powerful things to do with children from a very early age. Again, you know, in our program, we tend to focus in um, zero to five, zero to eight. Again, zero to five is just such an important period. It's when children grow the most, learn the most, yeah. and they start to create what we call core memories, yeah. right? And so this is such a powerful time Whereas if we are not, you know, proactively doing these things to intentionally show our children, you know, about interactions and communication, that time, you will not get it back. You will not get it back. Um, and, and, and that brings me to another very important point um, where we're seeing a lot of children really suffering uh, from certain things because of so much screen time. Right. Some of the things that we are seeing as a result of that is shorter and shorter attention spans. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that the child has a diagnosable condition. You know, people right away want to say, oh, they have ADD or ADHD, their attention span is so short. Not necessarily, you know, because if their only true form of stimulation is whatever they're seeing on the screens, that's not real life. Then in real life, they get bored easily. 
and they jump from one thing to another to another to another. Because they use the words, really a lot of stimulation. Yeah. So much, it's overstimulation yeah. what's on the screens. The other thing is um, low quality of sleep. We're starting to see this. Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, I, I've talked to some parents about is that they leave the TV on so their child could fall asleep no, too. I don't need, yeah. Oh, that's such a dangerous thing because one, um, something that we know, um, we get scientific here is that the light projected from those from screens actually alerts the brain. So it actually keeps you up more, yeah. you know? And, and adults can attest to that. You know, those of us that get late, at, once we put the kids to sleep and you're like, okay, this is my time and we start scrolling through social media, you're tired. Your yeah. body's asking for sleep, but there you are, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, it's stimulating, it's your, stimulating brain, yeah. your brain. And then for children, Again, um, if it's something that they like, they will force themselves to stay asleep until that episode or whatever it is that you put on there yeah. ends. And so not a healthy habit to engage children in, but if you do, it can be a very hard habit to break. Just like with the screen times, we're seeing a lot of children who become easily and intensely dysregulated when a parent may call time on the screen time because again, the child has become so dependent on yeah. the screen oh, for yeah. entertainment yeah. that they say, okay, um, time to return the tablet. And the child just gets very upset, yeah. very dysregulated. I've had parents who, who say, you know, I, I just end up giving it back to them because the what? screams and the yells and the tantrums are so severe. And how beneficial it will be just to allow the child to go through that. Because when I, when I hear temper tantrums, I think, what an opportunity to help children manage that. It's because already. yeah, when whenever we give them whatever they want, mm -hmm. they lose the opportunity mm -hmm. to really own that emotion mm -hmm. and to really notice how they can themselves regulate that. Exactly. How can they have the practice? I think we, we don't like it and then we get negative. Instead of yeah. saying this is an opportunity I can teach my child, you know, to really uh, learn what to do with those strong emotions and not to be afraid of those strong emotions. Right, and cope yeah. with those emotions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like I said at the beginning, parenthood is the hardest job in the world. And that's one perfect example that when our child gets dysregulated for whatever reason, whether it's because you took away the screen time or because you said no to a snack. Yeah. Um, I know that happens in a lot of households. We, we give in so easily because it is. It's very difficult for mm -hmm. the adult human brain to tolerate yeah. Uh, a child screaming, a child kicking, a child, you know, just having a full out um, um, emotional dysregulation like a tantrum. But if we are tough enough and we understand really the why, yeah. the why, why would I let this go on? And I think that this is when it comes to skill building, mm -hmm. one of them and helping parents understand also um, that it's okay to, to, that to remain in control. Nothing bad is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you being kind, but, but understanding, but at the same time assertive, you know, the firm, right. how is that helpful that, helpful that would be to, exactly. to the child when, whenever that happens, when we withdraw, mm -hmm. well, we, we give also, upper, when we withdraw electronics, we give the child the opportunity, the beautiful opportunity to deal with boredom. Because we want to rescue kids from boredom. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that is helpful. That, I mean, I, I, I didn't, we didn't have that experience. Uh, and no, you, you're we, younger we, than I am. Yeah, but I, I grew <laughs> up in the 80s. You know, my whole childhood was the 80s. And so, yeah, we had to learn. I saw, uh, I saw a meme the other day and I was laughing so hard because I said, yes, that is absolutely true. And it said, how kids today feel boredom, and yeah. it was a screen. Right? How I feel boredom at five years old, and it's like getting in front of the fan and making sounds with the <laughs> fan, you know? And it's like, yes, that we yeah. would resort to these other ways. Another one that I saw is trying to see how the refrigerator light works, you know? And, and it, it's comical, but it's the truth. Yeah. We learned how to deal with boredom. Our kids today are constantly being rescued from boredom. Not a healthy thing. The other thing is our kids are constantly being rescued from learning how to help themselves, exactly. right? We, we, again, when we are playing with them, a lot of parents, you know, the child is struggling with the blocks. Oh, give it to me. I'll fix it for you. Be patient. Give the child a chance. Oh, he's going to get frustrated. That's 
fine. Ooh, that's that's so awesome. a natural process. Yeah. And that's the other thing, right? Allowing our children to feel what they feel, guiding them on how to cope with those feelings, but not sending them the message that you're wrong in feeling the way you do, so you need to stop that. Oh, I think that the ch children become afraid of their own emotions, mm -hmm. afraid of their because they be quick to intervene mm -hmm. instead of being able to, you know, feel. learn to feel them feel. and then feel the, the height and then also when they are, are themselves regulating them because then they eventually they find something to do. And because that's one of the things that I think is more helpful that if you're busy and the kids say, Mom, I'm bored because you removed the screens, you can always say, I know you're bored. Yeah, you're bored. I can understand that. But I'm sure you're going to find something to do. Yeah. And you don't know, eventually, you know, they may be nagging a little bit, but eventually they come, you know, they're painting, they're playing outside, they're doing something, maybe they want to help you in the kitchen. So we don't know. What but they, they might come up with. But they, but they, yes, they develop their yeah. own ideas yeah. on how to deal with that. And of course, you'll have parents who say, uh uh, this is very dangerous territory. <laughs> yeah. Because if my kid goes off and does his own thing, I might find, you know, the place turned upside down. Yeah. It's like, okay, again, not a cookie cutter approach. You are yeah. the expert of your child. You know your child better than anybody. But in that case, it, what, what something that we always recommend to parents is just having a lot of things on hand. Yeah. You know, whether it's you go to the dollar store and you stock up on little arts and crafts or little toys or play or whatever, and you just have it. You know, like in my home, there's these two boxes. <laughs> that I've collected over time full of things, you know, crayons, paints, yeah. Play-Doh, whatever. And it's like, okay, here you go. You know, go nuts. Um, another thing is, when we let them do those things as a parent also is being okay with a little bit of mess. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you have kids, you have to be okay with mess. Yes. Right? And, and But again, it'll keep them busy. Yeah. Holy they learn other creative ways yeah. to eliminate their boredom. Two, it's much healthier than them being on the screen, that's for sure. Yeah. And three, you never know what's going to come out of that. Kids can be so creative and be like, look, mom, look what I made. Yeah. Look, dad. And you're like, oh, I didn't know you could do that, right? And you start to discover your kids in other ways, and it's a beautiful thing. And then, again, opportunities to praise them, to congratulate them, to make them feel good about themselves. Um, but more importantly, again, a child being de uh, is developing their ability to cope yeah. and to feel what they feel. There is, there is a, I don't know, it's a quote, and I don't know who said it, I don't know if it was, um, anyway, Adler or whoever, mm -hmm. that said that there's nothing more important for a child mm -hmm. than to receive the attention of a caring adult, right. a positive attention. Not, there's nothing more powerful, and I can, and I can, and I can, um, understand that um, because connections are so important and it's connections from a caregiver are so important let me let me um, get into recommendations and, and I'm, you know I want to talk about a little bit that you know about uh, special time mm -hmm. but give some recommendations some parents of what to do um, you know that is going to involve a little bit of um, work. work you know <laughs> patience and, and structuring but that it can be so beneficial beneficial to your child because we know that you love your child. That, that's a given. All parents love their children. Mm -hmm. How do you express that or, or how do you use the right information to make sure that your child develops is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. So what, what kind of recommendations and, and uh, would you give uh, in terms of um, increasing uh, caregiver children interactions or sibling and family interactions? Well, ideally, I'll talk about that first and then what we can do with our older kids. Ideally, you want to start early, right? From the moment the child recognizes your face, and that's very early on. I mean, within weeks, I mean, the child recognizes your face. Um, again, you talked, you briefly mentioned uh, serve and return. For those that are not familiar, that's simply this, the child serves you something, a smile, a giggle, a cry, and you return that with a response, right? Um, that's why many of us find ourselves being silly with babies, right? Because we're making faces yeah. and we, then we receive a smile from them or a giggle from them. And now we feel really joyous, right? Um, so start early with all that. Again, start early with 
if possible, not introducing screens at a very early age. Um, and if you already have, if you're one of those parents who are like, oh my gosh, my kid is 16 months and I give him the tablet all the time. Don't panic, don't worry. Yeah. Um, it's all about limitations and boundaries, right? And, and, and those limitations and boundaries with the screens, it's not just with the screens, it can be with anything, yeah. right? Because you're trying to teach your child that when the caregiver says, okay, enough of that, no, five minutes only, that's what it is. You want your child to learn to also honor that. Yeah. Right? How important and it is that they learn so, how to make those transitions. Yes, from, that, that's a transition. Yeah. Okay, enough of that. Now we're going to play with this or put on your shoes. We're going to grandma's or whatever the case yes, may be, right? Yes, yes. That's another thing that we see in the schools is children really struggling to transition between activities. Mm -hmm. They, they, you know, once they get into something, it may take them a little time to get into that activity, but once they do, then they can't make the change. Yeah. Very difficult. Um, the other thing is, if you've already introduced screens, one idea that I always love to share with parents, I read about this early on when I started doing this work, and I thought, oh, that's such a good idea, especially for parents that are really struggling with limiting screen time and simultaneously getting their children to do as told. Mm -hmm. So one idea, you can look this up online, it's called the screen time piggy bank. So you can literally have a piggy bank or some, sort of, of it, yeah. or some sort of container. Yeah. And so the child must follow through with commands, do as told, finish their homework, whatever are your expectations as a mm -hmm. parent, you know, uh, pick up their room, things like that. Um, and they earn time. Now, we want to be very careful with how much time we award. It can be from one minute, five minutes. For mm -hmm. the older children, it could be a little bit more generous than that. But they have to earn it, right? But once they earn it and they start using it, right, they got to keep doing as told or, or things because if not, they're going to use their minutes and that's it. I see, I see. So I think of it like when, when we all got cell phones for the first time, you know, you had like maybe 200 minutes for the whole month. You have to use those minutes very carefully because they would run out and then you have to pay a bunch of extra money for each extra minute, right? Of course, yes, that's true. children nowadays are like, what are you talking about, baby? Yes, there was a time when we got cell phones in the early you know, 2000s and it was just yeah. minutes. Um, but the, back then, our, uh, phones were only for talking. You would just make the call that you needed to make yeah. and receive the call you needed to receive and that was it yes, yes, yes. so we were limited and we were careful yeah. so same concept you know really using that as a, as a strategy for parents to one guide their children that they need to earn this because this is the other problem we're seeing that children feel entitled or they feel that they have ownership to these screens whenever and whatever they want yeah. And it's because somewhere along the line, we've given them the wrong idea that this is their property. Well, let me just, because I want you to continue talking about this, but I want to just interject um, that if your child is used to something and they, you're going to, you're going to change things, mm -hmm. it's going to be normal that you're going to get a lot of opposition, oh. maybe a lot of dysregulation. And I cannot stress enough how important it is that you see this, how important it is that they go through that. Mm -hmm. And you continue until you see success. Because when you see that, don't think that things are getting worse. It's things that eventually things are going to get better. Because I think parents give in immediately, right? It's like, it's like the saying that we always hear in, in, in mental health fields. You know, it's, it, things are bound to get a little more stressful before yes. they get better. Right, it's like when you're dealing with anything else, it's going to get true. a little bit harder, yeah. right? Or, or even with your own physical health, they find something. You may have to go through this very rigorous surgery and recovery period to get better. Exactly. So same thing. Um, we, stick we to deal, your guns. Stick to your guns and stick to your guns as parents, especially because children are so smart. <laughs> Trust me, I have a four-year-old. They're so smart, and they will hold you to your word. Yeah. They really do. Just like as if you promise them something and then for whatever reason you couldn't get it, they hold that to you, yes. right? They remind you, you said this and I didn't get it. Same thing if we say, if you don't do this, this will happen or not yes, happen. Yes. But then we do the opposite of that. They remember that. And they'll say, oh, well, last time 
mom and dad said that, but I don't think it's true. And they're willing to test that. They're willing to take that gamble time and time again. Hence, tantrums, right? But if we are just sticking to our guns, it's going to be hard. It's like sleep training. Yeah. Right? If you've been uh, cold sleeping with your children and suddenly you say, you know what? Enough is enough. It's time for them to sleep on their own. You know, the first few weeks of that sleep training process, it's going to be rough. They're going to get up. They're going to get out. They're going to come to your room in the middle of the night. They are going to put up a fight when you're trying to put them in their own bed. It's going to be tough. But the only way to get there is to stick to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, to stick to your commands. Stick and, to your uh, commands and maybe that can word. be a conversation mm-hmm. for another time because yeah. it's going to be important. Once you give command, you want to get as much response as quickly as possible. But it takes time for we'll kids, we'll kids to develop compliance. So don't, mm-hmm. don't get frustrated. I, I want to go back a little bit, if you don't mind, to you talking about uh, the bank. Uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the screen time the piggy bank. The screen time piggy bank. Yes. I wonder if you have any thoughts about adults screen time piggy oh, bank. Oh, yes. Yes. It's <laughs> because the same. parents tell them no. And then. Yes. Yeah. That's the other tough part with these screens, right? We can't just be telling the children, oh, only five minutes. Yeah. And they see your device permanently attached to your hand. We have to be the example to them. So if we have to put ourselves on a screen time diet, yeah. then we need to put ourselves on a screen time diet. Yeah, no, because. I- we are their greatest role model. In their eyes, as their caregiver, as their parent, you can do no wrong, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and we can't, it can't be do as I say, not as I do. You know, that doesn't fly with kids. Yeah. You know, they're like, well, how come you can do it? It's like telling a kid, you can't drink soda, but we drink a soda with every meal. Yeah, that's true. You, you know, we have to model, we have to set the example. So it could be like, for example, in our home, we have a rule. No, no, no phones at the table. My best friend does that. Yeah. 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 We sit down for dinner. We have our four-year-old who is like a sponge, absorbing everything, yeah. observing everything. And the rule is that we do not have the TV on because yes. from where our dining table is, you could see the TV in our living room. TV's off. We play music. And yes. what we do is we take turns. What kind of music would you like to hear? Uh, whose turn is it to pick the music? Of course, when it's my daughter's turn, it's all Disney songs, <laughs> but that's fine. We put the, the speaker or the Spotify or whatever, and we listen to the music, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the rule. Yeah. And because we've been doing this and she has any memory, yeah. that's, what it is. that's the routine. That's what happens. She doesn't yeah. question, can I have my tablet right here? Or can I borrow your phone? Or, you know, and, and my husband and I are really, really adamant about no phones at yeah. the table. Of course, our phones are somewhere close by in case there's an emergency call. Yeah. I'm not saying don't take a call. God forbid something happens. But not at the table where it's so tempting. I mean, nowadays, you get a notification for anything and we're like, okay, what was that? Yeah. Um, Email, text messages, everything. Or news, whatever. Everything. And that's another recommendation that I give to that I give to parents and adults that I that I talk to family members is really limit your notifications. Be very selective about what notifications you want to get. Or put your phone somewhere. Yeah, but but if you really need to have your phone on hand, limit those notifications. You know, you don't have to get a notification every time you get points for Starbucks. Like you can just go into your app later and check. (laughs) You know, if you really want to know. Um, So. Again, being the example. The earlier, the better. But if you say, oh gosh, I think we've already made some damage here. No need to panic. Just start making small changes, little by little, expecting resistance, expecting that the children will react, possibly not in a very favorable way, but then sticking with that and saying, you know, starting tomorrow, this is what we're doing. And that's the rule in our house. And that has to go for mom and dad too. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that, and you know, maybe in another conversation we can talk about strict training because I think parents get it, get the wrong idea about discipline. They think it is about punishment when it is about to getting kids to do certain things. For instance, like for example, a form of discipline is bedtime. Mm-hmm. Uh, a form of discipline is you brush your teeth at this time. Right. A form of discipline that is we use only screen time this time. And if if you do it early, then you don't get a position because it's expected from the child. Yeah, it's normal. Yeah, so it's normal. it is when you got them used to in a different way that you have to struggle a little bit. But how valuable? If how valuable for the child that they go through those emotions? How valuable for the parents 
to learn the skills of sticking to their guns, you know. And I think yeah. another thing to have very present for children is that every family is different. Yeah. But in this household, you know, mom and dad, grandpa, grandpa, whoever the caregiver is, this is how we do things. Yeah. Um, you know, because children, of course, as they get older, they get more alert, more observant, more wise, and they'll start to question. They will question. I had my four-year-old the other day, she went on a play date, comes back and says, so-and-so has a TV in their room. And she, my daughter does not have a TV in her room. There's no electronics in my daughter's room. And so she, I said, oh, okay, well, that's the decision that her mommy and daddy made. And she said, how come I don't have a TV in her room? And I said, because your mommy and your daddy have decided that that's not a good thing yeah. right now. Yeah. Maybe when you get older, when you're a teenager. And that was it, that was the end of that discussion. Because yeah. that's how we have always, you know, just listen, mommy and daddy want the best for you. Yeah. You have to trust us, that kind of thing. And say, hey, we have a TV in the living room and there's times when we have you know, movie night and you can watch your program yeah. at certain times. Um, but even that is, is also limited. What would you do if uh, parents told you, I do play with my children. We play video games all the time. Or I spend time with my children. We watch a lot of movies together. What would you say about that? I would say... There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with that. But how much of this are you doing, yeah. right? Is it on a daily basis? Is it just a special treat on the weekends? Like, yeah. how, what's going on here? What's the pattern? And are you dealing with anything? But I, I know that want to be critical, but I wouldn't call that play as we talk about play. No, I wouldn't call that special time. And by the way, we want to welcome Daniela Ortiz, our new uh, social media specialist who's behind the scenes right now, coordinated here also with Joe Lewis, our IT staff members. <laughs> At some point, you guys need to come out and I'll be over here. <laughs> In the credits. In the credits. <laughs> In the but um, um, how, um, what would be the recommendations? And like specifically, what toys do you suggest that they, they use? Special time, yeah. yeah. Again, we're gonna stick with the zero to five age group. Um, is one, we always suggest a toy that is not going to create a competitive type of situation. So, for example, something as basic as tic-tac-toe or a board game, checkers, that gets competitive. These young kids, again, we're barely teaching them, we're barely guiding them. Losing does not come easily to young children. Yeah. So that may create conflict, we might get frustrated, and there goes special time. Um, the recommended things is anything that would allow you and the child not only to interact and play together, but allows for creativity, free creativity. So anything that you could create, obviously playing with blocks or Legos, you yeah. create um, Play-Doh. I know it can be a little messy in some situations, but Play-Doh. again, got to be okay with the mess. Prepare for that. And yeah. prepare for that. Prepare that they're going to mix the colors for what for whatever reason. That's yeah. the first thing kids want to do with the Play-Doh is mix the colors. Yes. Um, but again, that's part of the creativity because if you if you watch, they're, they're trying to figure out if I mix this color with this color, what color is it going to make? That's their little yeah. brains working, right? And you can go along with that. Oh, that's cool. Let me try. You You're so smart. Play. Let me do it too. You know, because you imitate with them. Um, other things could be things like just basic paper, crayons, yes. markers, paints, again, anything created. So that's why I always want, I always give parents of these little ones a suggestion of having a box in your house. Like I said, you collect these over time, maybe you get them as gifts or you go to the dollar store or something and just have a box of arts and crafts. I mean, you know, um, um, the, those little sticks that you can twist, yes. um, popsicle sticks. Yes. That you can glue together and make little houses or little structures. I used to use the Lincoln Logs. I don't know yeah. if they sell them anymore. They, the... they do sell them. Okay, Maybe really. on Amazon. Uh, but yes, Lincoln Logs. In the office, when it comes to our play therapy, what the, the toys that are the most uh, popular and that the kids love is Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. Oh, yeah. You know, and they love just putting them in silly places. And this is where the adult yes. does not take over. No, the eyes go here. Let them put them out where the eyes go. Who cares? Um, And, um, of course, anything to to color or draw. We also have um, things to play pretend. Like we have this um, little barn with all the little animals, and they pretend and make the sounds of the animals. 
And then we also have some dollhouses and things like that, whatever they pay. For family family figures. So I think they're pretty yeah, cool. you can play pretend and make the voices, put on a little puppet show. You know, it's, it's just all about, again, is this activity going to allow me the opportunity to interact with my child, yeah. to model something for my child, whether it's using her imaginations, whether it's um, sharing, taking turns, and then will this not create a tenseful moment because somebody lost and now they're upset? Yeah. Right? Because yeah. we also have very competitive parents out there. They don't, let the, they don't just let well, their kids and win. Well, it's a disadvantage because we're right. a lot older. We don't, I, I, I've used board games, but in a different way. And I don't want to get into that, mm -hmm. how to use them. Uh, but I, and I recommend them uh, right now. But uh, anyway, so um, and how should they introduce the special time? Call it that. And now the child recognizes it. Right? Just like there's bath time and there's bedtime, yeah. there's special time. Uh -huh. And with young children, because you know, parents might be asking, okay, how long am I supposed to? When we do the therapy, or actually when we send the parents home with this homework, if you, if you may, it's five minutes a day. Five minutes, wow. But you would be amazed how many times out of the week, out of the seven days of the week, parents cannot accomplish this. Wow. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Um, again, um, it might be easier Monday through Friday because we have a more structured schedule. You know, uh, from this time to this time, the children are in school. I get out of work at this time. Dinner's at this time. Oh, we have this little sweet spot. Or maybe right after dinner, we have this little sweet spot where I can do my five minute special time with mm -hmm. my child. Mm -hmm. And trust me, five minutes can go a long way if you're not practicing well, this at home right now. Well, I'm thinking because my experience with playtime is that kids don't want to stop the playtime. So, yeah. Maybe they should increase it a little bit. I don't know. Right, right. And so that, again, you, you measure that based on your child, right? But you also want to teach them that it's so special that we need to take advantage of those few minutes we have together. Tell them in advance how long Tell them in be. advance. And then my favorite thing to do with young children when you're going to cut something off, don't do it abruptly. Give them a heads up. Yeah. Okay, we have two minutes left. We have one minute left. Yeah. Um, if you have children who say, hey, that wasn't five minutes, because <laughs> to them, maybe the time went by really fast because they're having fun with you, mm -hmm. set a timer. Mm -hmm. Set a timer when the bell rings, you know, that kind of thing. And again, this is all about practice and in, a, in, in other ways, training. Yeah. You're training yourself to really emphasize and spend a special time with your child a day, and they, they return that by expecting it, but also expecting it not to last for a long yeah. time. Obviously, there's other activities that you can do with your children that will last much longer, um, but that's not what we would call special time. Well, and I'm thinking that it would be awesome if they do it a lot more longer and, and more often, right? But at least, at least you can start saying, there, and if it's going well, you can increase it. Yeah. Right. Maybe well, I think when you use the skills, I think it's going to go well, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. If you at that, at that age range that you talk about, mm -hmm. I've used it sometimes even when I have kids that are 10, 11. Um, yeah. Sometimes I, when I used to do play therapy, when I had teenagers, I had a little basketball hoop and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. Anyway, what I'm saying is that giving that special attention with kids, one-on-one, yeah. um, -on -one, yeah. it's so important. So um, what would be different? Let's, let's say that a family is watching us and say, well, I'm committed to do 15 minutes a day with my kids, mm -hmm. uh, okay. and I can do it at least five times a week. What would be the benefits for for that kid and that family? I mean, especially if you're already dealing with something that you're struggling with or you're getting concerns from school, I mean, the benefits could be immediate benefits where the child is just, you know, more connected to you, not attached to you. There's a difference. Um, but just more of that connection, that communication, uh, that self-expression. Um, and again, just the child organically feeling good about themselves yeah. when a child feels good about themselves without crossing the line into being you know snobbish or cocky or anything like that um they just do better because yeah. they feel good about themselves right? we're so and correct me if i'm wrong we're so focused on correcting negative behavior mm -hmm. that we don't know when we establish that time that can be the basis for discipline. We, we, perhaps can we get more compliant kids if we have feel, they feel connected to us? Yeah. Definitely, because now the bond is stronger. 
the trust is stronger, the respect is stronger. Yes. So, you know, you get a kid who used to be, just ignore your commands or simply answer back no <laughs> to a kid who's like, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let me go do that. Okay, yeah, I'll bring you that. Yeah. And uh, one of the, the most important things that we do when we use uh, reflections is we utilize empathy. Lots of empathy. And just mm -hmm. how powerful empathy can be in transforming uh, relationships and transforming people. Absolutely. And, and you convey that to your child, so you learn childish to be empathic. And, and that could be as simple as a child asks you for a snack, and you as a parent, you're about to have dinner, and you say no, the child becomes upset. And just being able to reflect and say, hey, buddy, like, yeah. I'm so sorry that that upset you. I know yes. that's not the answer you wanted to hear, yes. but we're having dinner in a little while, and I don't want you to spoil your appetite. Yeah. And the child continues to be upset, has a tantrum, goes to their room. Um, that's fine. Those are their feelings, and they're valid. But you made it clear that you see them, yes. that you understand them, that you hear them. And, but, you're, and that you're not afraid of their emotions. Yeah. Right. Right. So you don't react with anger toward them. Exactly. Know? So yeah, it's, it's transforming. Um, the uh, I had a, an instance of one of my grandsons was going through mm -hmm. a hard time, and the parents were like, you know, reacting in a certain way. And so the only thing that I did was, and I, you know, stay with him and said, I know you're, you're feeling sad. I know it's been, you know, and, it's, and, and then when mm -hmm. it took like about ten minutes, it was a long time, mm -hmm. and then I said, you know. You were able to to be okay. You, you know, you were really upset. You wanted that, and then, but you were able to, you know, to to deal with that sadness or that anger. Yeah, yeah. proud of you. And then, you know. yeah, and they feel they feel good about that. Yeah. What they were feeling bad about, they can yeah. feel good about. It. So how do we turn that right yeah, yeah, to yeah, where yeah. they feel good that oh, yeah, I got really mad or I was very upset and I was crying, but yeah, I'm such a yeah. Such a good kid, such a big boy, whatever, yeah. that I was able to handle my emotions. And one of the most important things here to walk away with is if we teach this to our children early on about boundaries, limitations, um, about how to, you know, giving them coping skills and all these things, this is something that they're going to carry for life yeah. well, into yeah. adulthood. And that's what I'm saying, that many times... When I give parenting training, mm -hmm. I ask them to visualize the future because these are the building blocks exactly. of later communication, exactly. um, positive self concept, uh, getting along with others, um, you know, dealing with frustration, mm -hmm. coping with the negative things that we all gonna have to face. So we're really, you know, fostering, well, mm -hmm. creating a healthier kind of uh, human beings in the world. So our time is almost up, but before we go, I would like for you to give one last message mm -hmm. to our parents. What would you say to them as they're uh, tuning into this uh, podcast? I know parenting is really hard. It feels like we don't have enough hours in the day ever. But please, please, play with your kids. Just play with your kids. Interact with your kids. Laugh with your kids. Um, and communicate that they're everything in that moment, you know, that they are special, so special to you that in that moment, nothing else matters. And then um, if you did walk away, those of you struggling with screen time, uh, take the suggestion of the screen time piggy bank. It's a good one. When I discovered, I was like, oh, that's such a great idea. Um, and again, if, if you just have the little, little, little ones, start now. Start yeah. now in terms of those positive interactions, those healthy interactions, um, and you know, modeling for them what we would like them to do in the near future. Yeah. yeah. And if you became worried when watching this program, because maybe you're using a lot of screens and things like that, don't don't feel discouraged. Mm -hmm. And uh, feel hopeful. Look at your kids with pride, with amazement. And uh, implement as, as you can. And reach out, uh, you know, reach out. There are a bunch of resources. You can also call SCAN if you need more specific guidance. We have a parent resource center that you can always contact. And maybe 
Daniela, you can put that on the screen, the Parent Resource Center, and uh, the phone number. And if you have questions, right, you want to reach to, to myself or to SJ, uh, we can, you know, give you some consultation over the phone, and maybe through the Resource Center we can do something. So please, please um, reach out. And uh, we will do, uh, do this uh, in Spanish. So probably we'll record it this week also, so then it can be available to uh, our, you know, Spanish-speaking audience. So, so thank you for being with us. Again, this is Scan is here to help podcast, and we wish you a wonderful day.